Welcome to another episode of One on One on Plus TV Africa. My name is Elsie Godwin. On this episode, we would be looking at leadership, overcoming fear, and our role as citizens in fighting the coronavirus pandemic. Joining us via Skype is a man who likes to call himself an educator, Bishop Feb Idahosa. Hello, Bishop. Hello, how are you today? Fine, thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thank you. Despite the lockdown, we're doing good. Ah, uh, we're keeping safe. All right, glad to hear that. All right, so um, let's jump right into it. The pandemic has, in a way, further revealed the loopholes in our life systems, policies, and most especially leadership. How do you think we can begin to get leadership right for this moment and for the future? Excellent question. You know, um, this, this, this um, pandemic has really revealed that as a country, we need to, we haven't understood what leadership really is. Leadership really is the fact that as a leader, you're in front of other people. So that tells me then if you're in front of them, you have a responsibility to use the resources around you for the good of those who are following you, of those who are um, behind you. I had an article about two weeks ago, two weeks ago when this all began. And it was saying that this pandemic will put a stress on our healthcare system. And now we'll be forced to use the hospitals that we refuse to build. So if we had done some of these things earlier on, we would have um, an easier time dealing with these kinds of problems. So hospitals, um, resources, all of these things that we need to have done beforehand are not being tested. What we need to do as a nation then, um, as citizens and as those who are leading, is begin to demand more from those who are in front of us, those who lead us. We put you in office, we need to tell you, look, do some of these things, not just for yourself or for your family, but for all of those who are following you. That's really what passion is about. We need you to do these things for us, because if you are there, either by us voting you in, or maybe by, um, by you were put there by God, or you or we were put there by, um, by force, either way, we are your, um, you are your responsibility. Take care of us. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a demand that we must put on them, of, of, us, of those who lead us. So in putting this demand, what do we do right as citizens? How do we ensure we are putting the demand in the right way and make sure we are ahead? Well, see, I think over the last couple of years, it's gotten better. Um, 10, 20, 30 years ago, you, the fear of talking to, to leadership would make, would make us cower in our corners. But as generations change, as times change, we begin to use social media, we begin to talk to our, our, our leaders, we begin to say, look, we demand these things. We want a better healthcare system. We need these for us. And what we're seeing now, like, like I said earlier on, when we say these things, it's when things like this happen and no one expects that the demand now, become, now comes there. So for example, no matter how rich you are right now in Nigeria, doesn't matter how much money you have, how many planes you have, you cannot fly anywhere to get health care that's not in Nigeria. So it's time for us now to put these things in place because we can't fly out, so you can't, we can't go to America. America has their own problems. You can't go to Dubai, they have their own problems. Everyone is saying stay where you are and deal with your problems yourself. Now, until these things begin to affect me as a leader and my family, my children, unfortunately, Nigeria is that kind of place where it does not affect me, I won't talk. But now that we're seeing this affects all of us, and all of us are in that same common position, we have to say, let's do something. Hmm. So the idea of us not being able to get away from the situation, whether it's for the people in the government or just regular people, can be quite scary. So we are scared now, scared about now, the future and what comes post-COVID-19. As someone who people look up to for guidance, both spiritually and in their career path, how would you advise they handle and overcome fear this period? Well, fear really comes from um, not knowing what's coming next. And, and that's, I think that's probably one of the biggest issues of the pandemic is the uncertainty. No one is sure what's coming next. So I compare that to, let's say you walk into a room at night and the room is dark. It's, it's, a, it's a dark night, it's a dark room. You are afraid of walking into that room because you're not sure what will happen next. Are you going to hit your foot against a chair? Is there a monster in the room? Is there some that you're afraid of? Will you fall into a ditch? because you're not sure what's coming next. That's where fear comes from. So what do you do when you're in that kind of situation? You turn on the light. Now, when the light is on, you're able to see if it's a small candle, if it's a flashlight, if it's a light bulb. The, the amount of light you turn on determines how much you see and how much fear you, um, you experience. 
So then, I would say for the spiritual side of things, for us as Christians, you have to hang on to your faith at this time. You turn on the light by holding on to God. Your Father in heaven is the one that has always kept you. He's the one who has said, look, I'll be with you through thick and thin. I'll be there with you. I will hold your hand. I'll be there with you as a father. So I have to hold on to my Father in heaven in this time of crisis. That, to me, is the equivalent of turning on the light as a Christian. Hmm. Now, for your life as, as education or for in business, wherever you are, to turn on your light in that situation then to reduce your fear is to then begin to gather as much information as you can. Right now, oil prices are at an all-time low. So what's going to happen next? Start thinking, what do we do if oil prices have to stay low? If the things I've been doing before will not work, I must gather information and say, if these things don't change, what should I do? Do I educate myself? Do I begin to think about different means of getting the same end? That's how you turn the light on. And so the more lights you have on, this candle or flashlight or full light, um, the more light you have on in your business, the more light you have on in your career path, the more light you turn on, the further you can see. So I would suggest for us at this time, begin to gather information. We don't know what's coming next, but we can know what we can do to prepare ourselves in case this happens, but let's do this. In case that happens, we do that. So prepare yourself for the future by learning as much as you can now. Prepare yourself by gathering information. That will help you turn some light on and reduce the fear. So this is also a trying time for Christians. I mean, some have been accustomed to one way of staying connected to their beliefs, which is visiting a house of worship. Now times have changed and we have to make do with attending services digitally. How can Christians maintain their relationship with God this period? Well, I think that, that's a good question because as pastors, we've had an issue before where we equate coming to church with a relationship with God. And the truth is that's not how it works. Having a strong connection to, to our Father in Heaven does not mean you must come to church. But we have unfortunately always said, okay, come to church, that's how you get to know God better. And that was never the purpose for the church. That was never the purpose for which um, God sent Jesus to the earth. He was to connect man back to him and to reconcile us to God. So what we, need to, what should, what we should have been doing since is strengthening that relationship between man and his heavenly father. Whether it happens in church or happens in front of a computer screen or wherever it happens, we, must, we should have been doing that all this time. So now that we've said, okay, the house of worship is either closed or the numbers are reduced, we have to start thinking in innovative ways. How do we keep people connected to their faith? How do we keep them connected to their, to their beliefs? How do we keep them connected to a strong sense of the Heavenly Father in heaven and us here on earth? So that's what the church is doing now, is finding new ways of being innovative, of connecting people to their faith. Now we're using phones, we're using um, text messages. We're finding ways to do Zoom services online so that way, when I'm talking to you or um, my members in a small group, they can ask me questions. It's, it's changed the whole dynamic of how church is run, but it's making a lot of sense that now that God had a plan the whole time. God is everywhere, and it's now time for us to examine new ways of connecting people to him. As impossible as this might sound to some, there are definitely members of um, some congregations or even let's just call them Christians that cannot afford the data needed to stay connected with their pastor at this moment. Right. So how do you advise they still stay connected with their faith and with their God? Well, um, what some churches some are doing now, they're, they're sending out messages by text messaging and giving, giving the outlines of things to, to read and to study. They're sending out their devotionals, which, which we used to do digitally now. We're now, making, we're now going back to print devotionals. We're doing all kinds of different ways. The point becomes that um, we want you to connect to God. And we, we as pastors are not really the God you're looking at. So we're saying, let's be a guide that will help you say, connect to God by doing this. Connect by doing this. So I can call, make, we make phone calls. We send messages through WhatsApp. We send, that's okay, that's data. We send messages out through um, different ways. Sometimes they use, they use text messaging and say, let's read this today, read that today. The point is we want to continually make sure we connect people back to God. So for you who is not necessarily, uh, who's at home, doesn't necessarily have data, um, we're finding ways to send tracts, send information that's printed material. 
their point, once again, is to make sure we still keep people connected to their faith. And the church, then, is a guide rather than the one that we look to as the God. Because All right, let's talk education. You are one of the key players in the education sector as you occupy the role of the president at Benson Dahosa University. Now, how would you rate the level of penetration when it comes to online learning in Nigeria? Unfortunately, Nigeria, has, um, um, that position is quite sad. We, we, we've been working for the last couple of years. Several private universities I know of have been working with the NUC to try to increase online penetration. And sadly, the NUC had not been, had not been in favor of it because they, they've been saying, well, it might not work. How do, we, how do we curb cheating? How do we curb different things? And we kept saying, look, this is not something that's new. The rest of the world has been doing this for 20 years. And so they've dealt with all the questions you've had before. They, they've had they have ways to, to verify keystrokes when you type. They have ways to verify with cameras when, when we're talking. They have ways to deliver lectures by um, by video. So none, none, of, none of what we're proposing has been new, but the NUC has been a bit slow to um, accept that. Now, having um, run into post into, into COVID-19, they're rather all of a sudden saying, look, let's move our lectures online, let's begin to talk, let's begin to use the new means that are possible. And so, once again, this whole pandemic, even though it has a dark side, has many, many positive sides because it is forcing so many organizations to look at the way they work and realize one way that we've known things is not the only way things can work. In implementing this, aside um, having conversation with the government to get them to understand that this is what we need to do now, um, what have you identified as the challenges so far? The biggest challenges um, you, you, you hear people say over and over again are issues of data. Uh, students who are at home say they don't, they don't always have data. But however, if you look at it, um, many of them, we, we, Nigeria is one of the biggest users of Facebook in Africa. Nigeria is one of the biggest users of Instagram in Africa. So data has not really been the problem. The problem we need to begin to find out is how do we deliver content to students um, in ways that are not necessarily data hogging? How do we deliver content to students in ways that they can actually begin to interact? Nigeria uses WhatsApp to a huge degree. Nigeria uses um, apps like Telegram, other things like that. So it's a matter of now being innovative in saying we want to deliver content from our lecturers to our students, and then from students back to lecturers. The problem that we've had is from, for most of the time, when we are told that this is the way one technology works, we use it one way and forget that technology is really just a tool. It can be used in many ways to provide the exact same thing. So for example, now, things that we use all the time, your WhatsApp, your Telegrams, your, your Instagram, your Facebook, all of these are tools which have been there for a long time. We only use them in one way, to send pictures, to send information. Oh, here's what I'm doing, selfie this, selfie that. But the truth is, we have so much more that we can do with technology. And once again, this pandemic is forcing us to re-examine re all we've done and realize that all of these things that we do, you spend five minutes watching a video, you can use those exact same five minutes to, to deliver a, a lecture to students, then ask them to send questions back to you. These are things that we just have not been thinking about before because we're so used to using everything in one way and one way only. I think that you're talking about the diversity of technology. Now help us understand, because I was watching an interview on television and the conversation, um, steered towards distant learning. Now, some universities in Nigeria, of course, have distant learning. What is the difference between distant learning and um, online learning? Are they one and the same? They're almost the same. I think distance learning um, refers to, of course, um, providing learning resources over, over a distance, not in the exact same place. Now, online learning, I think, takes a little bit, takes a, a bit more. Online learning refers to then your entire system. So you, you have what we call a learning management system that manages the discussion, that manages how content, content is delivered to the students. It manages how students um, come back to the lecturers, how you provide your, your, your questions, how do you provide assessment of the, of the questions, how do you provide all these things together. That, that's, that's when you say online learning is, is taking place, where then we are the primary resource, the primary means of learning, primary means of, of communication is done online. Distance learning then just, is really just talking about saying, I, I send you information, you come back to me, we look at it. But online learning then takes the whole system, and then it also works to ensure that learning is also taking place, not just distance, distance education, where we just send information out, comes back to us. 
it's, it's, it's find a way to ensure that learning is taking place. Thank you, Bishop, for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for the time. And you stay safe, all right? All right, you too. Thank you. We'll go on a quick break now, but when we return, we'll be joined by a creative entrepreneur and a politician. <laughs>